Hey everybody, Dr. Ward here, and I had a special request to discuss shoulder dislocations. Now I talked about shoulder separations in another video. That's where the clavicle and the acromion separate from each other. But a shoulder dislocation involves the glenoid cavity and the head of the humerus coming apart in one leg or another. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So first thing, we want to get a little bit of uh, intro on shoulder motion. Taking the arm up to the side is referred to as abduction. Taking it close to the side is adduction. Flexing it forward is flexion of the shoulder and taking your arm back like you're in a pitch softball is extension. So now that we got the basic uh, vocabulary worked out, let's go over some of the actual landmarks of the humerus and the scapula itself. All right, now here we have some of the uh, features of the humerus I want to draw to your attention. First up we have the lesser tubercle greater tubercle. In between them we have a little groove for the long head of the biceps called the bicipital or humeral groove. Now, the head of the humerus here is attached to the rest of the bone through this uh, anatomic neck of the humerus, but just as important is this narrowing right here just above the shaft. That's referred to as the surgical neck of the humerus and it's a frequent site for fracture as we'll see in a bit. As I tilt here we can see a little bit more of the glenoid cavity. That articulates with the head of the humerus, and in life there's a cartilage disc that surrounds this area called the glenoid labrum. And it's important because the shoulder is an inherently unstable joint. It's very, very mobile, and with mobility comes the propensity for injury. Because it's so mobile, there's very little holding it together. The glenoid labrum, shallow though it is, helps deepen the articulation there a bit. But the major stability for the joint comes from its capsule, which wraps around the humeral head and attaches it to the scapula, but also the muscles that form a cuff around it, and that's referred to as the rotator cuff. Anteriorly, from the anterior portion of the scapula, we've got the subscapularis, attaching to the tuberosities right here. We have the supraspinatus coming across the top of the humerus to insert right there. We're going to flip to the posterior view. And here's that supraspinatus fossa, where the supraspinatus muscle comes from, out to the humerus right there. And the infraspinatus comes from this broad region of the scapula and inserts all the way around to the greater tuberosity right there. There's a fourth rotator cuff muscle that parallels the infraspinatus pretty well, called the teres minor. It goes about the same way. And those four muscles form a cuff, hence the rotator cuff, that keeps the humeral head relatively tight. They also externally rotate, internally rotate, and help abduct the shoulder. And that's going to come into play in just a second here. Now, one last thing I'd like to draw to your attention before we get going on to dislocations is that in this area, coming from the axilla or the armpit and coursing around the posterior side of the humerus, we've got a nerve called the axillary nerve. And that's what supplies the deltoid, the big muscle on the shoulder, as well as the teres minor. So injury to that nerve would cause weakness of those muscles, but more particular for acute injury, it's going to cause a little area of numbness, and it's kind of the shoulder patch region right here on the lateral aspect of the shoulder. So there's three major types of shoulder dislocation. The anterior dislocation, where the tumor head comes out forward or anteriorly, posterior dislocation, which is the opposite, and inferior dislocation, where it moves inferiorly. We're going to start talking about the anterior dislocation first, and generally this is going to happen for a few reasons. One, you can have the arm abducted, externally rotated, like you're reaching up for something to block a pass in basketball, and something pushes your arm strongly back, your forearm strongly back, or your shoulder strongly forward. So you get a strike to here that can drive that. Another common cause is someone falling backward and reaching their arm out behind them can thunk and push that forward, although that's also commonly associated with breaks of the clavicle. Let's take a look at what that's going to be close up. All right, so we're taking a look from the lateral side right now. So an anterior dislocation moves the humeral head forward and out of the glenoid fossa. Now it can come to rest just under the coracoid or even more inferiorly or even more proximal. So there's various places the humeral head can come to rest in an anterior dislocation, but they all have in common that it goes forward. Now in the process of doing that, it's going to stretch infraspinatus muscle posteriorly, and it's going to slacken the subscapularis muscle anteriorly. 
And anytime you have a dislocation, these muscles can very easily go into spasm. So having them relax is one of the key points in treating. We have an anterior dislocation. When someone presents with this having already happened, they're going to present with their infraspinatus muscle having been very much put under stress. Since it's coming posteriorly, they're going to present with their arm externally rotated fairly persistently. They're going to have difficulty internally rotating it because the subscapularis muscle is very slack. So you're going to have their palm turned out and their arm partially abducted at the side. Another common thing will be that their shoulder will kind of drop away and you may have a very clear and prominent acromial process in that, uh, in that same view. So that's a sign of an anterior dislocation. Now in the process of having an anterior dislocation, there's a few things that can go wrong. I've got another humeral head right here, and as the humerus dislocates anteriorly, it also tends to roll. And as it crosses the glenoid labrum, you can have what's called a hill sax deformity. I'm going to try to show that here, where the rim of the glenoid actually creates a little trough in the head of the humerus. So that can be detected radiologically. So that is a hill sax deformity. Another common thing that can happen during a dislocation is called a Bankart lesion. Now that happens as the shoulders um, or the humeral head leaves the glenoid fossa. It can disrupt and traumatize the glenoid labrum, that cartilage disc, fibrocartilage kind of disc that's forming a rim around the glenoid. So a Bankart lesion refers to any injury to that. Now bony Bankart involves avulsion of some of the glenoid uh, portion of the scapular bone along with the glenoid labrum and you can also have the glenoid labrum itself get traumatized in the process. That would be just a soft Bankart lesion. Just be aware, sometimes people will find disruption of the glenoid labrum anteriorly and it's actually a normal feature and not a Bankart lesion. So lots of people have an incomplete fusion of the labrum anteriorly and that doesn't necessarily call for surgical intervention. Moving on now to posterior dislocation of the shoulder, and not surprisingly, this happens when the opposite of an anterior dislocation occurs. A blow to the anterior shoulder with the arm abducted can force the humeral head out of the glenoid. Another cause that can actually come up a lot with the cause, and this is when the arms are adducted, internally rotated, and something pushes up from below. Now you can think of someone falling and putting their hands down to stop themselves. I like to think of a trap door opening and up, try to stop myself, and thunk your shoulder dislocates posteriorly. Let's take a closer look at that and see what the posterior dislocation appears like with the scapula in place. So in a posterior dislocation, the humeral head moves posteriorly relative to its articulation with the glenoid fossa. And that is going to do the opposite of the anterior. It's going to slacken the infraspinatus and teres minor muscles posteriorly, but it's going to tighten the subscapularis muscle anteriorly. So you're going to wind up with some pulling, subscapularis in particular, on the humeral head to internally rotate it. Because the subscapularis muscle is tight, you're going to have a person present with their arm adducted but internally rotated, and actually persistently internally rotated, so they're not going to be able to externally rotate their arm even when you request it. Now this posterior dislocation of the glenohumeral joint of the humeral head is associated with uh, labral tears, rotator cuff muscle tears, avulsion of parts of the tuberosities that are being pulled on, especially related to the infraspinatus and teres minor muscle, and also a reverse hill sax deformity where, once again, the humeral head rolls out of the glenoid and actually winds up impacting it, and the glenoid rim, being somewhat acute, winds up kind of punching a little bit of a trough into the rounded humeral head. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention is a uh, fracture of the surgical neck due to the angulation of this injury often commonly occurs with a posterior dislocation. All right, last up is the inferior dislocation of the shoulder. And that generally happens, no surprise here, when the glenohumeral joint, the humeral head moves out of the joint inferiorly. Now, it can be pulled down like this, but more commonly it's when the arm is abducted. It actually winds up bumping into the acromion here, and that leverage pops the humeral head inferiorly. And commonly this can be caused if you're falling from somewhere and you're grasping up at say a tree limb. Uh, we've had trap doors and grasping at tree limbs, so for those of us not living in a Scooby-Doo cartoon, another common cause is someone reaching overhead and holding onto an overhead rail 
say on a subway or a train and something suddenly stops and you're flung forward hyper abducting your arm at the shoulder. And this all can cause inferior dislocation of the glenohumeral joint. So inferior dislocation of the humeral head involves hyper abduction and you can see the humeral head just kind of pop out of the glenoid fossa right there. Now because the axillary nerve is very close to this area, this is the dislocation that most frequently has axillary nerve deficits noted with it. The others can also affect the axillary nerve, but this one is the one that most commonly has that numbness over the shoulder that we discussed earlier. Now, a person with an inferior dislocation of the humeral head will present most frequently with their arm superior, so arm sticking up over their head and their hand actually resting on the top of their head to minimize the pain and discomfort and immobility that they're experiencing right here. So we're not posing our buddy here for comedic effect. This is actually how people will present into your clinic when they have a inferior dislocation of the humerus. Now let's talk about treatment. First off, there are a lot of ways to reduce a dislocated joint, uh, the glenohumeral joint right here. Generally, it's going to depend a lot on the individual presentation, the patient involved, the type of dislocation that happened, and most importantly, any other injuries that have occurred. As we mentioned, you can have fractures of the humerus, avulsion injuries, bank heart injuries, uh, hill sacs lesions, or deformities, I should say. All of these things can be going on at the same time, so I'd encourage you not to play uh, amateur doctor when somebody's got a dislocated shoulder and get professional medical help. But reducing this dislocation generally tends to follow certain principles that are true for a lot of them. You have to prevent the spasming, or at least reduce the spasming of the rotator cuff muscles. So gentle release, moving the scapula one way while trying to get the humerus another way is going to be frequently employed in a lot of the motions that are used. Sometimes doctors will put weights around the wrist of a patient and have them lie supine or prone so that they have that gradual traction and as these muscles relax, the glenohumeral joint can move itself back into the glenoid fossa. You uh, will often also flex the shoulder if you're going to do any manipulation here so that you're decreasing tension of the biceps long head as it crosses right through the same area. And traction can be done not just pulling the humerus one way, but by pushing the scapula the other. And frequently doctors will do this by wrapping a sheet around one arm and a sheet around the person's torso and gently, I'm going to emphasize that, very gently applying traction to the dislocated joint and allowing the muscles and the feel to guide the humeral head back home. All right, hope that's been instructive and have a great day.